Good morning. I would like to officially welcome you to Chemistry 221, and I'm very glad you're here. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Russell. You can call me Dr. Russell, Russell, Michael, Mike, anything respectful is fine. Just don't go after the Mikey bar because of a life serial problem from the 70s, which we'll talk about later. Anyway, what I'd like you to know first about Chemistry 221 is that this time right now is mostly time where we're going to go over new concepts, new lecture material. And so at this time, I won't be talking about like the syllabus and the format of the class. I will do that during your lab section this week. So there are four lab sections. There's a Tuesday morning one that starts at 8 a.m., a Tuesday afternoon that starts at 1.10, a Wednesday afternoon that starts at 1.10, and a Thursday morning that starts at 8 a.m. And whichever one of those four sections you have, that's when we will go over the syllabus, we'll talk about the assignments that are due and stuff like that, how the class works. Before your lab period, if you want to be really cool for school, and of course I'm sure you do, uh, there are two things that if you bring with you, you'll be totally set. The first one is the Chemistry 221 Companion, and I see several of those around here, which are awesome. The Companion is basically my fancy name for the lab manual, and it has all of the labs you'll need, the problem sets, and stuff like that. Also, if you can get some kind of lab notebook for lab, that would be cool too. Something where the pages can't be taken out and put back in again. So like the composition books are cool, uh, spiral notebooks would be all right. Don't use though like a three ring binder because you can take the pages out and put them back in again. If you can get those two things before your lab period, whichever time you have, you are good to go. Um, please make sure you attend lab this week and that you're there on time. Uh, my classes are actually amazingly full this quarter, which I'm very pleased about. Um, in case you weren't there, then there's a possibility you might get dropped and stuff, so make sure you're there. Any questions on that kind of stuff before we start talking about chemistry? Yeah. Or do we hear this out? Sorry. <laughs> That's legit. I don't, read, I don't read body language or anything, man, so sorry. Yes? Absolutely. Chemistry 151 is a really cool class, and it's a way that people can get ready for Chem 221. Um, some people here, I know, uh, took it with me in the summer, for example, but it's not a requirement. And if you've taken um, chemistry like in high school or something, that's fine. And honestly, just really devoted students with good math backgrounds no, don't have a problem. Um, at any time, if you have questions on things, definitely let me know. If you want to consider Chem 151, though, there's still ways to transfer over, but by default, yeah, I would say, geez, let's try it out and see what's going on. Cool. Good question. All right. Chemistry is a pretty cool field. I'm glad you're here. We're going to share a lot of interesting things. You can tell uh, I've got this little funny tripod thing going on here with my iPhone. I record all of the lectures, and they're not exactly Academy Award winning video productions, shall we say. However, later on, if uh, you're like, wow, what did Russell say about fill in the blank? You can actually go back and look at the videos and stuff and then see what's happening. You can go back and record. Also, if you do happen to be gone from lecture, uh, you're welcome to look at these, and sometimes people have me on the big screen, which is very embarrassing, but anyway, they'll be watching me while vacuuming or whatever. Okay, that works for me. Um, it's a possibility for you and stuff, which is totally fine. Um, all of my notes are uh, lecture-based, like a PowerPoint kind of program I use. And in the companion, there are printed versions of all these notes. So what I would recommend if you do come to lecture, is you just kind of follow along with the notes and you can write things on the side and stuff like that. But you can use you know, your own paper too, it's whatever you wish to do is totally fine. Um, cool, so without further ado, let's start talking about chemistry. And again, the important thing is that we'll talk about the format of the class, what's due, how this class works during your lab period this week which will again will be Tuesday morning, 8 a.m., Tuesday afternoon, 1, 10 p.m., Wednesday afternoon, 1, 10 p.m., or Thursday at 8 a.m. We'll talk about that stuff then. If you can get the companion and the lab notebook before then, that would be really cool. Questions? Glad you're here. 
Let's talk about what chemistry is. <laughs> chemistry is a really fascinating science, of course, to me. I'm biased, obviously. And I'm hoping to share some of my enthusiasm of chemistry with you. But what exactly is chemistry is a really good question. How would you describe chemistry? This was a cheesy little video that came from um, production for National Chemistry Year and stuff. But anyway, I like the enthusiasm of this video. It shows the many different places that chemistry can be part of. Chemistry is part of the physical sciences, like physics and geology, astronomy, stuff like that. And the chemistry part is mostly about the transformation of matter and energy. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. There's a couple of chairs over there, guys, and there's also some down here. And just make yourselves at home, all right? Don't, you can come down, get right in front of me, it's okay. <laughs> I, it's good, take the spotlight off me, I'm kind of introverted. Anyway, okay, prof hat back on. I'll say prof hat back on once in a while when I kind of babble about something that's kind of stupid, so just get ready for that. So yeah, prof hat back on after it. Okay, prof hat back on. <laughs> anyway, and if you have questions at any time also, please let me know too. Chemistry is the science of matter, of its properties, and of its transformations. All matter is made from about a hundred elemental forms, the elements. Intrinsic to matter is energy. The waves of the ocean are energy made manifest and obvious. But energy permeates even the most subtle interactions of matter, and is fundamental to chemistry. So chemistry is mostly the study of mass, all right, of matter. And matter, though, doesn't just stay matter, it transforms. And so along the way, we do a lot of interactions and study of the pro process of energy transfer as well. So we'll talk both about matter and energy and the transformations that go along with them. Um, the interesting thing, though, to me is that Everything around us, all right, your clothes, your cell phone, uh, the chalkboard, everything, the things we're breathing, it's made up of one of these pieces up here. Now, this is the periodic table, as I'm sure you know, and the periodic table has the most current version, about 118 different elements. And those elements are literally the building blocks of everything around us. So from caffeine <laughs> to sugar and all and TNT, I mean, all kinds of things. Everything comes from here. And that's really kind of cool. I like to think of this as my alphabet. In the English language, there are 26 letters in the alphabet, and imagine the words that come from those 26 letters. My chemistry language has 118 letters to it, so imagine the possibilities that we're gonna be able to get out of these letters, the different compounds and stuff. Now, the name chemistry is fascinating. It actually comes from an Egyptian process that was used to prepare people that are dead for mummification and stuff like that. Chemia, I'm not saying it right, and stuff like that. So chemistry has often been seen as kind of a dark science, all right? A cult and stuff, because it was round people who were dead and stuff like that. Uh, some people call chemistry the four-letter word science. I, of course, don't agree with that, of course. But anyway, uh, you'll see some kind of weird feelings sometimes about chemistry. But I'm going to try and dispel all of them for you in this class. I want you to see the cool kind of things that chemistry can do. Matter is made of atoms. When two atoms of the element hydrogen are bound to a single atom of the element oxygen, they form a molecule of water. Atoms and molecules are amazingly small. Because atoms and molecules are, in a practical sense, impossible to see individually, Scientists often depend on models when working with and discussing them. A single drop of water contains more than two and a half billion trillion water molecules. 
So matter, like I said, is made up of these 118 or so letters of the alphabet. And there's many different combinations. So just like the letters of our English alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, they can make different names and words and stuff. Oh man, in my world, they can make a lot of different compounds. But one thing that's really interesting about chemistry is how small the atoms are. Oops. I just put down more molecules of water in that little bit of water I let out there than there are teaspoons of water in the Atlantic Ocean. So imagine, if you will, pretend that that was about a teaspoon of water. And of course, it was probably more than that. But anyway, pretend it was a teaspoon. A teaspoon of water has more molecules of water in it than there are teaspoons of water in the Atlantic Ocean. All right? And if you've seen the Atlantic Ocean, it's like the Pacific. You know, you can't see Europe or anything like that. Anyway, it's big. All right? And there's a lot of teaspoons in there. However, I just put more molecules of water down the drain than there are teaspoons of water in the Atlantic Ocean. So that means that the molecules real small, all right? I'm not talking about seeing a micro so small. I'm talking about really, really small. And that's going to play a part in chemistry. There's going to be lots and lots and lots of very, very, very small molecules running around. And we'll talk about the ways and stuff that scientists have developed to deal with that. There's a couple of chairs down here, man. Just feel free to come on in. I know it's a little awkward on the first day, but just come on down. Man. So there's one right there and one right there. So yeah, cool. Make yourself a Matter changes. Atoms and molecules are in constant motion. Heat increases this motion. The amount of motion dictates how well atoms and molecules can hold on to each other. The less motion there is, the better the hold, and the more solid the matter. When liquid water is cold enough, its molecules arrange in a particular structure and turn to ice. When heated, the vigorous motion of liquid water molecules separates them from one another, and they become an invisible gas. One thing that's important is that we're going to see the same matter in different phases. And a lot of times the phases have to do with temperature, but there are some other factors that happen as well. And the most common example of this by far is water. Water is H2O. We'll talk about what that means in this class. All of you, I'm sure, this morning have had something to drink, all right? Coffee, water, tea pop whatever you drink and stuff like that. That's the liquid form of water. But it was a nice day on Saturday. Maybe you needed a cold drink, so you took out an ice cube and put it in your liquid. Ice is solid water. It's the same H2O, just a different configuration of different molecules. On the other hand, this morning, if you were like me and you're like, oh God, caffeine, please. So coffee came down, a little steam coming off. Steam is also H2O. It's also hydrogen and oxygen together. So the transformation of matter is also an important thing that we'll see. And to get from one phase to the other, we'll talk about the energy required to make that thing happen. So matter changing is going to be something we will also pick up on. There's several chairs over here, and you're welcome to just come on down, just come in front of the class or in the back, whatever. The front first day is always exciting. Don't be shy and stuff. Oh, it's just welcome to Chem 221, so <laughs> welcome. Yeah, there's several over there. Anywhere you want to sit is totally fine. All right. Cool. Matter interacts with other matter and is transformed. Life is perhaps the most complex expression of chemical interaction. Living things transform matter to further their own being. They are transformations of matter. Life radically changed the chemistry of Earth and its atmosphere. 70% of the oxygen in the air is produced by microscopic plants in the oceans, and the rest comes from land plants. Complete understanding of the chemistry of even the simplest forms of life is beyond our present comprehension. You don't have to like Star Trek or The Simpsons to do well in this class. However, it doesn't help with such as one of my poor jokes. So here's a Simpsons reference. Homer Simpson loves donuts. So imagine there was a donut right there. He'd be like, mmm, tasty. Homer Simpson would be like all over that. All right. It was like something in the show he likes a lot. All right. On the other hand, I don't know if this is true, but let's pretend that Homer Simpson doesn't like anchovies. So there's anchovies. He's like, ugh, I don't like anchovies either. You can probably tell. Anyway, so Homer 
Homer likes the donuts, he doesn't like the anchovies. And I bring this up not just because I'm trying to promote Fox, but it's because uh, some chemical reactions are going to happen. All right, there's like an attraction for the two species together, Homer and the donuts. On the other hand, there are some reactions, Homer and the sardines, which are not quite as likely to occur. So figuring out which reactions will occur and which reactions won't occur is also a part of chemistry. The last part of this video, though, is really cool because it shows how complex life is, all right? Life is beyond, I mean, in theory, there should be some kind of way to predict how all the interactions are going to go, but there's so many of them, and they're so small that we're, we, we're nowhere near that. Even with our powerful quantum computers, stuff like that, we still have a ways to go before we figure out all the different parts of it. Chemistry is the science of matter and of its transformations. The equipment this diver wears allows him to breathe underwater for a very long time. The carbon dioxide he exhales reacts with chemicals in his apparatus to produce oxygen, which he can then rebreathe. This diver can explore the sea with greater freedom because chemists have helped develop every piece of equipment he uses. Chemists press the frontiers of knowledge in laboratories and offices with test tubes and computers. In the pursuit of the practical, they too are explorers. In some ways, science is an exploration, all right? Like the people in the ocean right there, that's probably making it sound a little Pollyanna. But anyway, it is true. There's different ways to explore. And even uh, when you go into chemistry as a student, you can figure out new things. And some of the things I did in my graduate work had never been done, and they're not going to cure cancer or anything like that. But it was like an exploration of the world and seeing what's happening. So chemistry has some pretty cool applications. At this point, you probably think that, oh, chemistry is the ultimate. However, I do want to bring up that chemistry doesn't work all the time. People make molecules for all kinds of reasons. One of them is that a molecule is beautiful. That, for instance, is uh, the case with this fantastic platonic polyhedron, as it's called, of dodecahedrae, with uh, 20 carbon atoms in it, with 12 faces, all pentagons. This was made not too long ago by a friend of mine at Ohio State, Leo Piquet. Now, he made it because it was a goal, a mountain to be climbed. Many people had tried, no one had made it, and it's aesthetically pleasing in its symmetry. You see this gracefully curving triple helix? Now, this structure has not been made. What I see is that it's, it's pretty, it's beautiful. Roald Hoffman was a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, and his chemistry is using something called the isolobal analogy, which you don't need to know, um, was a real cool thing. We'll talk about it in Chem 222. But he also kind of fashions himself as a type of an artist, pretty aesthetically pleasing. And I don't know, that doesn't work. He also published some poetry, which I found just horrible, so I'm just going to read a little bit of it. Um, there was no question that the reaction worked, but transient colors were seen in the slurry of sodium methoxide in dichloromethane. And we got a whole lot of products from which we can't sort out the kinetics. The next slide will show the most important I wrote. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. It's pretty bad. He should absolutely stick to the chemistry. So chemistry and art, maybe not so much, but chemistry in the practical world, of course, is quite beautiful. So anyway, chemistry is going to be pretty cool. Now, in addition to the Roald Hoffman, there are some other famous chemists that maybe you've heard of. Uh, and just, this is kind of FYI, my favorite by far is Dolph Lundgren. He was in some of the Rocky movies, the Expendable movies and stuff. He actually has a master's in chemistry and uh, he's, he's uh, pretty cool. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister of England. She has a bachelor, she had, I guess she's passed away, a bachelor's in chemistry. <laughs> and even of all things, Pope Francis right now has his master's in chemistry. So woohoo, chemistry, you can do more than just chemistry. All right. It, it, yeah, totally. if, you, if, if you hear of other cool people, let me know, man, because this is kind of fun stuff. There's a couple of seats down here. Guys, you don't have to stand up. There's like one there, one there, one there. Go ahead and move around. Don't be shy or anything. We'll make it. Have a 
The temperature of carbon? No, Kelvin. Kelvin, yes, that's right. We'll talk about Lord Kelvin, uh, his, that's his official title, later on this quarter. And uh, I'll have some disparaging remarks to make about it. However, the Kelvin temperature is really important. Absolutely, man. Good. Chemistry as a field is split into different dis disciplines, if you will. So when they take the whole field, they cut it down into different types of specialties. And the most famous uh, branch of chemistry is organic chemistry. This class, Chem 221 through Chem 223, is called the majors level chemistry. It's like the first year. And the second year class that people usually take is organic chemistry. And organic chemistry is basically the chemistry of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, the CNO group right there. Other elements close to those will also be in organic chemistry, as well as a lot of hydrogen. But what I do want you to focus on is how small of the periodic table that they really do focus. And there's a reason for it, all right? Um, <clears throat> here at Mount Hood, we have two full-time organic chemists on the faculty. Um, and stuff that are there. However, though, my field of chemistry is called inorganic chemistry. And basically, it's, they say it's everything not carbon. That's a little vague. It's mostly about metals, all right? I've always been a big fan of the metal. <laughs> Slayer, Metallica, no, sorry, just turn prop that back on. Okay, that's a good prop that back on. I'm saying something really stupid. Anyway, <laughs> as always. Anyway, metals, uh, we'll see, have some really cool properties to them. The colors were really neat. So I'm an inorganic chemist, as well as one of the other chemists here at Mount Hood. Um, but there's also analytical chemistry, physical chemistry, and biochemistry. And analytical chemistry is very important. This is when you use something called spectroscopy, which is the study of light and matter. And it's the way that a lot of compounds are identified. If you're a fan of like CSI, uh, forensic kind of shows, they're always using analytical chemistry to figure out what's in the material. Physical chemistry is where physics and chemistry come together. This is a cool field where basically all the things you learned in this class as well as physics come together. A lot of measurement and modeling of systems goes on. Biochemistry is the fifth part, and biochemistry is where biology and chemistry come together, the chemistry of life, if you will. So there's a lot of transformations of proteins and DNA and stuff like that that are really cool. One of our chemists here is a biochemist. That's like her field of study. In addition, though, there's lots of other types of chemistry that you may run into, and these aren't names you need to know or anything. Um, chemical engineering is a type of engineering where chemistry and engineering come together. Nuclear chemistry is the chemistry of nuclear reactions, which is pretty cool. Um, geology, biology, astronomy, all these kind of things are different ways that chemistry can really play a factor. So. So there's lots of different places where the, you'll see that math is close by chemistry. Chemistry, when we model things, we use math. So math and chemistry are close. We're probably more interested in math than math is in us, but that's okay. Uh, we'll do some math and stuff along the way as well. Math. Math is cool. So these little elements on the periodic table, which is what it is, each one of those little boxes up there is what's called an element, all right? So it's the periodic table of the elements. The periodic table literally lists all of the elements that are known. And almost always the periodic tables are out of date. And that includes this one right here. This one right here, you can see, only goes up to 114. And some of the last ones have these weird UU kind of element symbols on it. This is an old periodic table, I'll be honest. The current periodic table, which we'll talk about in lab this week, actually goes up to 118 under radon right there. And they have actual symbols. You can see on the periodic table that most of the elements have either one letter or two letters. And the first letter is always capitalized and the second letter is always lowercase. So if you see one of these UUQs or UU somethings down there, that just means that those are placeholders. At the time, they weren't sure if the elements had really been found or not. So once they did get found, then they were assigned a name, and you won't see those on modern periodic tables. 
But again, why this is cool is this is literally the alphabet of chemistry, all right? So you can imagine what you can do in the English language when you go A through Z and you put different combinations together. Oh, my alphabet has a lot of letters to it. So we're gonna make lots and lots and lots of different combinations of these things together. And you'll see they're, they're pretty cool. Um, the phases of matter is a phrase that we'll talk about. Uh, a phase is nothing more than if it's a solid, liquid, gas, something like that. And you'll see all different forms on the periodic table. Some things are very soft solids, so you can cut them easily, like sodium. Aluminum, of course, of aluminum cans and stuff is uh, also a solid. Some compounds are mostly a liquid. This is bromine, uh, one of the non-metals. It's kind of a nasty, dark red liquid. But it's easily turned into a gas, so this kind of fuzzy, brown, yellowish kind of stuff over it, that's the gas phase of bromine. So we will talk about not just how those elements exist, but also how they transform from one into the other. These little things right here are ways that we can represent the atoms on the atomic level. They're so small, but we'll use models to kind of better represent them. Yeah. Is the, with mentioning bromine, is there a fourth hazard related to bromine? In chemistry, I would always think of them as being potentially hazardous unless told otherwise, yeah. So bromine in its pure phase would be really nasty, uh, but bromide with an extra electron is a little bit safer. So yeah, we'll talk about some of this stuff coming up here. But it does bring up the fact, and I'm glad you said it, is that in chemistry, always assume, man, everything is dangerous because if you don't know, it's probably not going to be okay, <laughs> right? It might be, but man, don't gamble on it. This guy right here, his name is Lavoisier, was the first one to define element. Lavoisier is quite a character. Um, he was a great scientist. We'll talk about him a little bit more. Lavoisier was a chemist that actually lost his head to the guillotine. Woohoo! Fact of the day. Anyway, <laughs> kind of sad. Yeah. Anyway, he was on the wrong side of the French Revolution. But anyway, Lavoisier's work continues on. So, yeah, history. Yeah. Anyway. <clears throat> Bezerlius uh, is a scientist, and he was the first one to come up with the idea that you could have these letter symbols for atoms, all right? And that was kind of a cool thing, too, because before that, people had used names like Quicksilver for Mercury, and those are cool names to use, but when you're doing this kind of stuff, the symbolism is really nice. There are a couple of elements that were known before the time of the Bible, all right? Not many of them, all right? Uh, and they had different, usually, astronomical things associated with them. So gold was the sun, lead was Saturn, etc., etc. There's not a lot of them around, but there were a couple of them. So most of the periodic table has been discovered, if you will, since roughly 1800 or so on. Most of it's pretty new. And now a magication lesson in chemistry. Need help remembering the periodic table? Try this simple phrase. Harry Herman liked being big, cause not one forest near National Mount Goon allowed sick puny Sasquatches. Clearly arbitrary, this kick caused scads of tiny vermin to cry. <laughs> And that's how you remember the periodic table. <laughs> I, uh, I had to show this. I thought that was so funny. So a big thing I get asked a lot as the chemistry instructor is, how many elements do I have to memorize? And some people will memorize the first 10, or the first 18, or the first 36. The answer in this class, how many elements you have to memorize, technically, is zero, all right? I will always give you to use on quizzes and exam a periodic table with the names and the symbols on them. So if you don't know that C is carbon, all right, you can do this kind of thing until you find carbon and you can figure out the name from there. That being said, the more familiar you are with it, of course it makes your life a lot easier. So it's nice to know that carbon is C, HE is helium and stuff. So I do recommend that you become familiar with them, but there won't be like a quiz or something like that on what does the symbol XE stand for or something like that.
We'll talk more about this in lab. I do want to bring this up again just because a lot of people have joined us. In Chemistry 221, we'll go over the syllabus and how the course works during your lab time this week. So your lab will be uh, Tuesday morning at 8 a.m., Tuesday afternoon at 1.10, Wednesday at 1.10 p.m., or Thursday at 8 a.m. And during that time, we'll talk about how the course works, the assignments and stuff like that. Um, before that time, if you can get the companion and a lab notebook, that would be awesome. Any questions? Yeah. We're going to need goggles eventually, too, is that correct? That's correct. Um, starting in the fourth week, we're going to go through a series of labs where goggles will be important. That's right. Tomorrow, it's optional. All right, it's not really required. Yeah. Well, we need gloves. Uh, I will have gloves for you. Um, you will never have to wear them, but we always will have them if you can. And if you can put your goggles on right now, if you'd like to, that's not a problem. <laughs> yes, go ahead. The lecture Wednesday and Friday is the same one as today, right? Um, Maybe one a week? Yeah, it'll be the same. Uh, it'll look, whatever we stop today, we'll start there on Wednesday. So it, it will be new material, um, but it'll be this. It'll just be a continuation of this one. So. Okay, so we're supposed to come Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? Yeah, I highly recommend that you come Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 o'clock to see me. All right, because uh, I kind of enjoy lecturing my cheesy jokes and stuff. However, um, this thing right here is also recording the video, uh, this lecture. So let's say you can only come Mondays and Fridays, that's cool. You can watch this video later on your computer, or your smartphone, stuff like that too. Um, again, I, I recommend that you come, but it is an optional thing. Yeah. You said the lab route one, but on the website it says that it's at 8 to 9.15 from 10 to 11.15. Cool. So there's two lab sections in the morning at 8, and there's two in the afternoon at 110. So yeah, so you just have one of the 8 a.m. ones, man. Yeah. There's um, there's four sections of this class and stuff, and, and yeah, two of them are at 8 a.m., and two of them are at 110 p.m. So just follow the one that says on there. You don't have to come to all of them unless you really want to. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> don't throw tomatoes at me, please. Anyway, other questions? These are good questions. Periodic table didn't always look as it does right now. Mendel E first put it together, and he looked at the elements by mass. So the lightest one, hydrogen, was first, and he put them in increasing heavier, heavier elements. As the periodic table became more developed, however, they found it was better to organize it by something called the atomic number. And the atomic number we're going to see in the next section is really nothing more than the number of protons. We'll talk about what a proton is there later. What was cool about Mendeleev is that by looking at these patterns, he predicted the existence of these four elements before they were actually discovered. So that's why it was kind of cool. Mendeleev was kind of a weather scientist more than a periodic table, but he was good at organizing the data and figuring out how these things all got put together. So the periodic table is critical to chemists, all right? It is like a cheat sheet. I'll tell you ways to cheat with the periodic table as we go through this course. Uh, you can also have a periodic table table. I don't recommend this, but maybe in your backyard you might want to put it there. Ba -bum -bum. Anyway. If you were to ask me to summarize on one sheet of paper all the potential things that could happen in chemistry, not only in chemistry, but in all fields of science, physical science that is, uh, and maybe in engineering, the one sheet of paper I'd give you would be the periodic table. That's everything we ever will do in science is summarized here. All the compounds that we'll ever make will come just from combining these elements, these hundred odd elements on this one sheet of paper. The number of compounds that could be made potentially out of this are practically countless. We now know of maybe 10 million compounds, but with only perhaps five elements, thinking of the ways we could combine them, we could potentially make 10 billion compounds. So if we were to combine many, many elements from the periodic table, the number becomes absolutely enormous. 
what he's referring to is that basically carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, maybe a little sulfur or phosphorus, you, there's almost 10 million compounds just from those five elements, all right? And we have just begun to scratch the level of how deep those kind of goes. But that doesn't include all of the other elements which have potentially uh, unlimited. So the number of compounds, the number of things you can do in chemistry is just incredible, and it hasn't been explored. This is a field where there's a lot of things that are, I'm gonna give you the best place we are so far, but there's still work to be done. I'll show you the limitations of some of the theories we're going through. But knowing these are really important. Probably a lot of you have in your wallets or backpacks a cell phone, all right? About a third of the naturally occurring elements are used in your cell phone, all right? And there's different components in the screen and the batteries and the processors and stuff like that. So knowing about chemistry is really important. You can, you know, text your friends, you can look at their website, we'll talk about that during lab. Um, all of these kind of things, but you're using about a third of the elements on the periodic table, which is kind of cool. Now I said earlier how small the atoms are, and man, are they small. This is a home movie, if you will, of a little carbon action, carbon family, woo And each of those little dots is a carbon atom, all right? And they're really, really small, very, very small. We measure the distance of an atom usually in nanometers. Now a meter is about three feet in the English, you know, we'll talk about that more later. So this is 10 to the minus ninth meters. This is a really, really small, different kind of thing. Um, this is a picture of copper atoms that people were able to make. We're just now getting to the place where you can actually see these things in little movies. Um, again, it's much smaller than like a microscope in biology or something like that. It's kind of cool, especially here what IBM did, I think we'll see a little bit. Every one of the atoms has three important parts to it, and they're called protons, neutrons, and electrons. And all atoms, more or less, are like little tiny balls. They're spherical. The center of the sphere has what they call the nucleus. The nucleus is where the protons and the neutrons are. And then around it, kind of shimmering, and we'll talk about why it's shimmering, that's where the electrons are. So the nucleus has the protons and the neutrons, and the electrons kind of go around the outside. Now the modern periodic table, these blue numbers on these periodic tables, those are called the atomic numbers. And each one of those numbers refers to the numbers of protons in the elements. So if you're curious what makes carbon different than nitrogen, or hydrogen different than helium, I would argue that at a fundamental level, it's mostly about the number of protons. And we'll talk about this more uh, in the next section. If you take those atoms, though, and you put them together, that's when you get into compounds. And compounds are more interesting, usually, for people than the prior elements are. And there's different versions of compounds. This particular one right here is something that you'll actually make in lab in Chem 223 if you decide to take it. This is a compound with nickel, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen atoms. And the middle one right there is the nickel. The rest of these are hydrogens. This is a combination. So as a scientist, as a chemist, if I wanted to tell you about this, I could draw out this structure. You could figure out what the atoms were based on the colors and stuff like that and figure out what it is. There are millions of compounds out there. This isn't by any means anything that you should ever be expected to memorize. Just realize this is one of the way that scientists talk to each other about different compounds. Now at this point, if you have an eye clicker, which looks like this, but yours would be white instead of blue, get it out and turn it on. An eye clicker is an optional thing to purchase from the bookstore or Amazon. It is not required, all right? However, what I'll do in my lecture, and this will be the first one, is I'll have an eye clicker question. And it's basically like a multiple choice kind of thing. I'll put up a question, there'll be several answers, usually five, and on your eye clicker, you just click which one you think is the right answer. 
if you click B and the answer is E, you're not kicked out of the class. <laughs> I want to let that be clear. But it's a good way to kind of keep you engaged in lecture. People feel like they're on a game show. Woohoo! Did I win? <laughs> and it's okay if you don't win. We'll talk about the right answer after I give everybody a chance to try it. When you first turn on your eye clicker, it should say Hi Chem 221 or something like that. And in a minute here, when I start the iClicker program, then you'll be able to pick the answer that you want to. So without further ado, let's check this out. So here's a question, an iClicker question, and it says, which of the following is not a compound? All right? And I'm gonna turn it on right now, make sure that it's all working. There we go, now it's working. Oh, I see the numbers coming up, good. So at this point, you can now enter into your iClicker uh, which you think the answer is, and there should be like a check next to it if you have one of these kinds. So the question here is which of the following is not a compound, all right? And a compound, like we said, is just a combination of different elements to make something more complex. So what you'll do when you're looking at these answers is you want to find the one that has that is not like a combination of elements. So this is sodium and this is chlorine. This is hydrogen and that's oxygen. So those would both be compounds, combination of elements. But you can probably imagine potassium, which has the symbol K, that's by itself. So potassium is an element. So the answer on this one is C. And yes, if you pick something else, you can still click C and it'll give you the right answer and it's totally fine. These are just thinking questions. I want you to be engaged in it. I don't care if you try the wrong answer. This is kind of a silly thing. It's kind of a fun thing, but I want to recommend it is optional. It's not required. You can still participate in these. Just write down on a piece of paper and stuff what you think the answer is and check yourself. But if you do have one and you participate in 15 lectures, it's worth a little bit of extra credit. So play it by ear. Quick, do I see a question? All right. This type of compound that's shown right here with a nickel and some non-metals, which we'll talk about, is called an ionic compound. And ionic compounds have two parts to them. They'll have one part with more electrons and one part with less electrons. A lot of the glue that holds the atoms together um, can be expressed in this ionic kind of a part right here. So if, I, if you hear the word ionic, it just means you have like a true positive and a true negative center coming together. And those are usually pretty strong interactions. However, one of my favorite molecules, to be totally honest, is caffeine. You probably couldn't tell from your weird instructor, but anyway, caffeine, which is in coffee and tea and chocolate and a whole bunch of other things. This is actually what the molecule looks like. Now, believe it or not, the atoms that are in caffeine and the atoms that are in water um, are missing a metal. And we'll talk about what a metal is in a later section. But because neither one of these compounds have a metal in them, they're referred to as a covalent compound. In a covalent compound, the electrons are kind of shared with each other. So if you have hydrogen and oxygen coming next to it, the electrons from oxygen and the electrons from hydrogen kind of share with each other, all right? In the ionic, which we saw earlier, the metal will give an electron to the non-metal, so the non-metal has more of a negative charge and the metal has more of a positive charge. And in my world, that makes a big difference. Ionic compounds with metals, very strong, high melting points, difficult to break up. Covalent compounds, because they're sharing the electrons, they're easier to break up. And you might think, oh, well, covalent bonds are worthless then, obviously, they're weaker, we want stronger things. And that sounds right. However, life is dynamic. All the things that we do with our bodies basically involve covalent bonds. Bonds in our bodies are constantly being broken and reformed. If we had ionic compounds, the energy cost is too high. So life basically exists through covalent compounds. Ionic compounds play a part, but the covalent compounds are really important. So a weakness here, if you will, is actually a strength in the long run that allows life to happen. We'll talk about these things more later. Cool. Now, 
This is a picture of gold, and this is a picture of mercury. Mercury is actually a liquid at room temperature. Mercury, sometimes it's called quicksilver. Uh, it's a fun looking liquid to see move around. It's very dangerous, so be careful with mercury. Uh, however, they are the same. These two pictures right here show the atomic structure of gold and mercury. And you can see that they're very, very similar. Of course, the colors have been changed to better reflect the metal and stuff. But sometimes you can look at changes on the atomic level to make sense of what's happening in the world that we live in. As a scientist, you should always be interested in how the molecules or atoms are put together. And gold and mercury here are the same. Looking at them, that wouldn't be the first thing that comes to my mind. Like gold is in a raw form, is very structured and hard, and mercury is soft and liquid. However, on the atomic level, they're very, very similar. In chemistry, we have to think about the world of you and me, which we call the macroscopic world. It's the world of remote controls, it's the world of cell phones and pencils and papers, um, all the things that we see. And we try to correlate things in the macroscopic world with things on the atomic world. So these would be examples of what's happening in gold and mercury's world on an atomic level, like how the atoms are placed together. Sometimes you can make connections between what's happening in the atomic world and what's happening on the macroscopic world. But sometimes, like this example right here, you'll see that they're quite different. We'll talk in this class several times about the things that we're used to seeing are actually quite different on an atomic level. So sometimes things will be really wild. Symbolism becomes really important in chemistry because we can't see these little atoms, at least not easily. So we'll use symbols from the atoms, we'll use different combinations and stuff to see like how these things happen. A balloon filled with hydrogen and surrounded by air represents a potential chemical reaction. To initiate the reaction, we need to ignite the balloon. The hydrogen will combine with oxygen in the air to form water in gaseous form, releasing considerable energy in the process. At the molecular scale, the molecules of gaseous hydrogen, H2, and oxygen, O2, combine to produce H2O, water, generating heat and light. So in our world, if you take a balloon it's filled with hydrogen gas, light it up, all right, it reacts with the oxygen around, balloon goes pop, it's pretty cool, all right? That's what we see in our world. That's what I would call the macroscopic world. That's the things that you can actually observe. Now, on the atomic level, though, we can also use symbolisms and stuff to see what's happening. The balloon has hydrogen, those little white atoms. White is usually the color of hydrogen atoms. And outside, in the air that we breathe, we have oxygen. So the little red atoms there are the oxygens. You, we light, we basically light it up, we add a little bit of a spark, and there's an instant transformation into water. This is a water molecule. People say H2O because there are two hydrogens, two whites for every one red one. Yeah. So we're turning hydrogen and oxygen into water. And this one right here is how we would write it out. Notice how there's like an arrow, and to the left is before, and to the right is after. It takes two hydrogens and one oxygen to make two waters. This is what we'll talk about in a future lecture as well. I saw some hands on So how come when you pop the balloon, you don't see water? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, water exists as ice, as liquid water, and as gaseous water. And there's so much energy released that the gas, the water absorbs the energy and becomes a gas. But we could take that gas and condense it back down to a liquid if we wanted to. Great question. But it made fire. Uh, the, uh, the spark was the transformation. Um, chemical transformations uh, will often release energy, and the energy will have a color to it. And that's the kind of spark color and stuff you see right there. So I should name one more on fire. Well, <laughs> I, it's not really like a fire fire, but it's something that can be observed, let's put it that way. And when people study like reactions on Titan or Mars, they're not there, obviously, so they can use these kind of colors, quote-unquote, to see like what's happening. We'll talk more about that this quarter, too.
Cool question. Good question. So when it comes down to matter, there's three main phases we'll talk about. Solids is one phase of matter, and solids are like ice, like ice, like liquid water that's been frozen. Very rigid shape, fixed volume. There's also liquids, so liquid water is of course the form of water that we're most used to and stuff, to drinking. And there's gases. Now all of these have different things. Solids are actually pretty easy to understand, and gases are pretty easy to understand. But man, liquids are tough, and we'll see why that is in Chemistry 222. But you can see how the solids have a rigid shape and fixed volume. Gases can be compressed or they will expand to their container, and liquids are all over the place. Now, if you're really into science, there is a fourth state of matter called plasma, and we'll talk about plasma in Chem 222. It's a really cool thing, but I'll start getting off target if I start talking about that too soon. Is that the magma? Magma is from a geological process. Uh, magma is like hot liquid rocks basically flowing and stuff. That's my 30 second definition. Plasma is uh, something totally different. All right, this is a great place to stop. One day of Chem 221 down. Remember to bring your companion and a lab notebook to lab if you can. If you can't, just show up. Have a great time. Thanks for being here.